Father, we thank You for the privilege tonight to be able to turn to this book of Acts, the Acts of Your Holy Spirit, and we know that You never change. We want to understand all of the theology and all the doctrine, Lord, of everything that is in this book. But we also, Lord, want to practically experience the life that is described here. And so we pray that Your Holy Spirit would freshly come upon us now as we study Your Word, Lord, and where maybe something has kind of almost gone out in some of our lives concerning the things of You, that You would stoke those things to a flame again, once again in our lives. And Lord, for those that have never experienced for one reason or another the things that are described in this book, that You would, Lord, come upon their lives, our lives, and help us to experience the fullness of this book. Lord, all we want is Your will in this world. We want the fullness of Your Holy Spirit, the fullness of what You've provided us with as the body of Christ for the commission that You've given to us. So we appreciate this glimpse at how You worked in that early church. We want every bit of it for ourselves. So we pray, Lord, that You would teach us tonight toward that end. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening to you. Acts chapter 3. The day of Pentecost has now come. In Acts chapter 2, 3,000 men have been saved. Now the emphasis of their life becomes the Apostles' doctrine and prayer, the Lord's Supper and fellowship, in addition to serving the Lord in the baptism with the Holy Spirit for now becoming mature their life with Christ. I think it's very, very important as we look at Acts chapter 2 last week, there are sometimes in the body of Christ, there there are two, actually, (laughs) there's considerable extremes. And we want to be careful not to find ourselves in either extreme, where there can be a tendency on one part of the body of Christ to emphasize almost exclusively the baptism of the Holy Spirit for maturity as a Christian and neglect the importance of the Apostles' doctrine, prayer, fellowship, and the Lord's Supper. Then there's another portion of the body of Christ that will emphasize the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship and prayer in the Lord's Supper, but almost exclusively neglect the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And what we see in Acts chapter 2 is the necessity of both of those things coming together. It It is an exercise in frustration for me to hear a study on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then to think that the Christian life is completely one dimensional in that way. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does what it does. It provides power to live this life. But what is the life that we're aiming at? What does the life look like? That we're going to get from the Apostles' doctrine. And then it's going to be lived in the context of fellowship, the importance of prayer. So you don't you don't overemphasize one to to the other. It takes all of it to produce mature Christians. And and so we see it in Acts chapter 2. Now, some period of time goes by between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. We don't know how long of a period of time. Surely it wasn't a a, a tremendous length of time. And we read here that Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So Peter and John, two of the early apostles, they go up to the temple at the hour of prayer. They're in Jerusalem The hour of prayer, we're told, is the ninth hour. The Jews kind of run their uh, watches a little bit different than ours. The ninth hour would have been 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They measured the day from 6 o'clock in the morning as the start of a new day. Now, you may look at things and you say, why in the world are the apostles going up to the the temple at the hour of prayer? And the Jews had three hours for prayer. They would meet for prayer at the temple in the morning at the time of the morning sacrifice. Then in the time of the evening sacrifice, which is what they're doing here, late afternoon, 
and then they would meet for prayer at, at sundown. And so here they are coming in on this, this middle period of prayer. And the apostles, they don't disconnect themselves from their Jewish roots there. And so they're going up there. It's a time to pray. They can pray. They're the ones that have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And doubtless, they're going up to the area of the temple is an opportunity to stay connected with the Jewish people, looking for an opportunity for God to use them to share the gospel. And they're going to get quite an opportunity. (laughs) Because in verse 2, there's a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, who was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful and they laid him there for the purpose of asking alms from those who entered the temple. So here you have the circumstance. They're making their quit way quickly, the same way that you do maybe when you're running to get to church right on time. And we'll assume that all of you are getting there just about on time. And uh, so you're kind of moving, you know, and they're moving through this gate called Beautiful. And this man, all of his life, he's 40 years old, as we're going to find out perhaps tonight. And, and, they, and for 40 years, he is born from his mother's womb, lame in his feet. And we know that Luke is a medical doctor. He writes a description of his lameness. And in his healing, we know that somehow that joint, the problem was with the ankle joint. And the idea is kind of like that his feet are, at, that are twisted out. And maybe you've seen uh, someone with their feet all the way out, though today we can correct an awful lot of these things. But when he came out of his mother's womb, Those parents looked at that child and they knew that child was in for one long, hard life. Because man did not have the power to change the physical condition that that boy was born in. And they could look at that boy and they knew that this man was, this boy was destined to a life of begging. And what they knew about him at the time of his birth, he had lived for 40 years. You can imagine every day of your 40 years, you've been a burden to somebody. They pick you up, they carry you from your home because you can't carry yourself, and they take you and they put you by the gate of the temple so that you can beg. And if you're going to beg, beg at a religious site. That's the way it goes on all over the world. He may be lame, but he's not stupid. And so where do you go? You go where God's people are gathering because you know that they are among the most compassionate in the world and generous. And so you've got a chance of being able to beg enough money to be able to buy enough bread to eat for that day. So for 40 years they've been plunking him there with his feet that are good for nothing there in order to beg that he might uh, kind of earn his own living this way. And so... There he is, and as Peter and John are going by, this lame man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asks them for alms. you got a shekel. you got a shekel for me, guys. And so he's he's begging. He's He's asking for money. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. And so you put yourself in the lame man's position, and what is that? Your heart, your heart is uh, elevated. <laughs> because in, in the begging game, if you can get eye contact with someone and you can begin a conversation, or if the other person begins a conversation with you, you're on their way to getting something. Almost always. That, so he has a sense immediately his heart is elated because... He's going to get something out of this. But his heart, as high as it might go up, all of a sudden it sinks with the first thing that Peter has to say to him. He gave his attention to Peter and John, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. (laughs) Then get out of the way and let me ask the next guy. I mean... There's only a, so much of a window of opportunity. They're rushing in for prayer. Every moment is kind of important to me right now when they come and when they go. And I really, you know, not interested in a conversation with you. So, silver and gold have I none. Oh, but the Lord, He's not going to leave people in this condition. And so Peter continues and says, But what I do have, 
I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He didn't lift him up to heal him. He lifted him up so that he might experience the healing that that God had brought into his life. Sometimes we need somebody to help us up a little bit with in terms of our faith. And when Peter says to this man, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, the, the name represented a person. So what Peter is saying is, Jesus Christ of Nazareth raises you up and is raised up. Raised up. The testimony is, and what it's going to turn into in this next sermon, is that it's a testimony to the fact that Jesus isn't some guy that just lived and died, but that He is resurrected and that He's ascended and that He continues to work on the wor- in the world and the great evidence that He does from heaven is changed lives. How many changed lives are there in this room tonight? Quite a few, I would say. All of us that knows the Lord. We are nothing like what we would be apart from Him. I don't think I'd want to know you apart from Him, and I know you wouldn't want to know me apart from Him. So God changes lives. Now, the interesting thing about this, and one of the lessons I think from that's important for us practically from the book of Acts, is what you have here in Peter and in John, but Peter is our main focus here, is a sensitivity to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter did not go along and pull every lame man to his feet. That temple area was probably lined with beggars, lined with lame people. But something happens when he comes by this particular lame man, and I believe that what happens is he gets a word of knowledge from God. That's a spiritual gift where God gives you a piece of knowledge that you could not otherwise have apart from him. And God, and there's tapes in the tape library on all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you can check out. I haven't changed my position on any of them since I taught that, so you're safe there. So a word of knowledge is God gives me a supernatural fact that I couldn't otherwise have. God speaks to Peter, I'm convinced, and says, I'm going to heal that lame man. And then I'm convinced that he couples with that gift of a word of knowledge, the gift of faith, which is also listed as a gift of the Holy Spirit, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because you, you sit there and you look and you think, well, that's just something that I'm making up myself, that God's going to heal this lame man. So what does the Lord have to do? He's got to give you a gift of, of faith so that you realize that, no, it's me talking to you. I'm going to heal this lame man. And so I'm convinced that he received a word of knowledge and then the gift of faith to stop, to look him in the eye. God is going to heal this man. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up to your feet and walk. So you see in the apostles and the early disciples, a sensitivity to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we are to desire earnestly spiritual gifts. The Christian life is a supernatural life. It is to be a supernatural life. And one of the things that we have to be careful of, two extremes, but one of the things we have to be careful of is not to try and force God into things, just kind of say things out of, you know, our own thinking, our own poor theology to everyone that's lame or or needs healing or something that, you know, do this and, you know, and that kind of... But But the other end of the extreme is to grow comfortable with a Christianity that is entirely marked by my own limitations. When God intends to use us, and there is more to the Christian life than just being open to Him using me. There ought to be a sanctified confidence that God is going to use me. It's the only reason we're still here drawing breath. That He's going to direct me by His Holy Spirit and He's going to use me to tell people about the fact, the truth concerning Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so that sensitivity where we wake up in the morning and there is that anticipation, Lord, I ask that You would use me today in this dark place called planet Earth. And Peter 
is going along. He's busy. He's heading off to a prayer meeting and everything. But he's sensitive to what it is that the Lord may want to do. I remember the first time I ever was in the middle of something where I got exposed practically to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I was in little old Napa, California, my hometown. And I was on Jefferson Street on a Saturday night with a friend by the name of Jim. He was older in the Lord than I was. I was a brand new Christian. We decided we're going to go out street witnessing in Jefferson Street in Napa. It's the cruise street. Everybody's out there and all that kind of thing. The spring or summer, whatever it was, lots of people out there. We began to make our way all the way up the street. And we were witnessing to everybody that we could witness to along the way. And we got to McDonald's on, on North Jefferson Street there. And at that time, McDonald's was about the most happening thing uh, there in, in Napa in terms of hanging out there. And we started to witness to, to people. And we came upon this one guy that's sitting on a bench there. And my friend by the name of Jim, he starts to talk with a guy. And all of a sudden... He begins to say to this guy, he says, wait a second. He said, the Lord is telling me that you've just broken up with your girlfriend and you're thinking this and you're doing this and God has said this and you know this and this is what you need to do. And I'm thinking to myself, now they're supposed to go out in twos because the guy that's with you is supposed to be a help to your faith. I'm thinking to myself, this guy is blowing it. All we've got to do is witness to the guy. We don't have to go this far. What if you're completely wrong? We're going to look like nuts out here. But this guy had... I mean, these were gifts that God had given him. And everything he said to that guy in those two or three or four sentences was absolutely spot on. And we end up, the guy's on his knees and he receives the Lord in a crowded parking lot in McDonald's. Because he knew that no one could know those things about him, much less a total stranger. It was God that was speaking to him. And I learned a lesson about that. And have tried to walk, sometimes more successfully than others, in my life, Lord, is there something that you want to do through my life? Something you want to speak? You ever had this thing happen to you? Where you're just going along, mind your own business. It's a day like any other day. You're moving, you're heading to the prayer meeting, you're heading to this, you're heading to that, the crowd, the coming, the going, all that thing. And you may go across 5,000 people in the course of a day. You just walk past them. You don't even notice. I mean, you notice the multitude, but you don't even notice them. You're just moving. And all of a sudden, God causes a single person to just all of a sudden explode in technicolor. You see Him and you know, I'd never, I would never know you existed unless God drew my attention to the fact that that you do exist. There's nothing about them. I'm not talking about young guys checking out young girls. (laughs) I'm just talking about, you know, looking at their old guys, whatever the deal is, or or old girls and young girls checking out. But, I mean, just the thing where you just look at a person and you'd say, that person, I mean, you just, I would never, I would never have taken note of you. And yet God, all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, they're, they're, you're, you're just filled with a sense of love for that person. I mean, God just overwhelms you with His love for that person. And there are times where I'll walk across, sometimes in an airport and sometimes downtown or wherever it might be, and I say, I don't know what this is all about, and I don't know your story. But I believe that God wants to tell you that He loves you, and then to tell them about the Lord Jesus. And then you leave it in the Lord's hands. But that's the way He does. He just pulls us up and we say, Lord, what are you doing? And then He gives us the gift of faith we would, you know, to do something that we would never otherwise do on our own. But the prompting is so strong. It's not just, okay, I've got to witness to 30 people today and if I, I'm, I'm up to 28 and I'm, I'm heading for home, I've got to catch two people at Rayleigh's. You know, where you put that whole deal on yourself and then, then it's all the flesh. And, and it, it, but where the, the prompting is so strong that you know that if I leave this situation without talking to that person, I'll have been disobedient to the Lord. And I know what that feels like, too, because I've done that also. 
But that sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, that spiritual, supernatural element to this life. And it's very easy. You're going to get a nice little church building like this. Nice people. You're nice people. I'm a nice person. Just like you. And it's real easy over time to start to play it safer and safer and safer and safer. And we lose a very important dynamic of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to take faith, but God will give us the gift to do that. I don't know how many of you are in this room tonight because God used some gift of the Holy Spirit and popped into your world in a way that you knew it could only be God. That's what He does here in this man's life. Some kind of a healing, some kind of a word of wisdom or word of knowledge or whatever it might be. But God help us, seriously. I've been serious all along. But God help us at Calvary Chapel in Modesto to be more than open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but to earnestly desire the best gifts. Whatever the gifting is that, and calling that God has upon our lives, but to really, really be open and expecting these things as it relates to our lives. If it only happens once every six months or once every five years, it doesn't matter. That's the Lord's deal. He manifests those gifts however often He wants. But as long as He knows, Lord, I'm Yours, whatever You want to do through me today, and, uh, and because I'm, I'm so willing to live down to the level of my limitations and everyone to look at my Christian life and see that it can all be explained by what I was born naturally. I don't want to do that, Lord. I want you to be seen through my life. And he'll answer that. He'll answer that prayer. He'll use that kind of openness. And so he, verse 8, leaping up, <laughs> if there was any kind of doubt in, in Peter's mind, it, it was, gave way to joy here. He leaps up, he stood and walked and entered into the temple with them. So here he is. He's healed by the Lord. And notice what he does. His life has been changed. And notice what the first thing he does with his changed life. He follows them into the temple. He uses the healing to draw closer to God. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to go down to the pub and, you know, down some brewskis or something like that. No, I mean, he knows God has done something here. And he's leaping, he's standing, he's walking, he enters the temple. And then, you know, as if we don't quite... God knows we really need to impact it. It tells us He's walking and He's leaping and He's praising, his, praising God. So He leaps, He stands, He walks, He walks, He leaps, praising God. Now this is going to create, create quite a crowd. Just thousands are going to gather around this guy and Peter's going to preach to them. We know it's going to be thousands that are going to gather around because 5,000 are going to get saved as a result of, of this particular message. It is God's responsibility to heal us spiritually, and to change our lives. And then it is our responsibility to respond to what He does in our life with this kind of joy for all the days of our life. Can you believe that you're going to heaven? I can hardly believe it about you, looking at you. And yet one day I'm going to stand on that glassy sea. I tell you, I'm going to stand there. And I'm going to stand in front of that crown, that, cra- that throne. I'm going to take my crown and I'm going to cast it right before the, my Lord. I'm headed there. Again, we're talking about this morning how easy it is for a red light to make us forget all about these great things that are cause for joy within our lives. And our lives cease to be marked by this kind of joy. And this kind of joy and this kind of change in a human life, it draws a crowd. It draws a crowd. Because people are wondering who in the world can produce that kind of a change. And so all of the people, when they saw him walking and uh, and, and praising God, they saw him. And then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And so a changed life, it's obvious, for 40 years. Hi, Ralph. Hi, what's the other guy? You got the dog? You got the big dog? What is it? Fred, Sam? You're as confused as I am. This is a useless group. Lord, why? What? Doesn't anybody know their cartoons in this room? Sam, isn't it? 
Okay, God bless you if you said Fred. There's grace for that. Morning, Ralph. Morning, Sam. Whatever, you know, that whole kind of a deal. They're just going by. Here's a shekel. They're just moving around and everything. But now all of a sudden, this guy that has been a fixture at the beautiful gate, fixture, all they've known him is lame, and now the word begins to spread like wildfire in the area of the temple. Something's going on over at the beautiful gate. That guy has changed. Something's happened over there. That guy that laid there for 40 long years, he's dancing and he's jumping and he's walking and he's praising God. Well, we better get over there and, and see what's going on. And so they do. And as I said, they come by the thousands. And when they see it, they're wonder and amazement at what happened to them. So they're wondering, all right, we see a change, but why the change? Now here's Peter. He's going to speak his second sermon now to these people. Remember the first sermon that he preached on the day of Pentecost? What was he doing? All he was doing was he was clearing up misconceptions that they had about God and what God was doing on the day of Pentecost. These men, they said, oh, they're they're drunk with wine. He says, oh, no, no, we're not drunk with wine. It's too early for that, for good Jews. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then now here, they're wondering what in the world is the source of a changed life here. And Peter is going to just answer that question for them. And a person can spend all of their life witnessing for the Lord, just answering the misconceptions that people have about God or the wondering that they have about God how God is able to change a life. And so here is this thing. They're wondering. Peter knows that they are. Now, at the, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all of the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So this lame man has got a death grip on, on Peter uh, there and John. And, and the word that's used... In the original language, it's the grip that a police, uh, an arresting officer places upon a criminal. In other words, you're not getting loose. So he has this death grip on them. And now everyone recognizes as they come that somehow this miracle that's occurred in this man's life is attributed to these two men, to Peter and John. Now, a great miracle has been done. Now the question becomes, who is going to get the glory for the miracle that's been done? And that's what this sermon is all about. And when Peter saw this great crowd coming together by the thousands, and he sees them, you know, marveling at this changed life and all, and that somehow they're ascribing the miracle to, to Peter and John, when he saw it, he responded to the people and he said, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? And the emphasis is on the word you. So I don't have a bunch of Gentile pagans in front of me. Why do you as the Jews, the descendants of Moses, the great miracle worker, the ones who have the prophets Elijah and Elisha, the great miracle workers in history, all your history has been a history of a miracle working God, and yet you're amazed at a miracle. And he's confronting them with how far they've fallen. That There's religion all over the place in Jerusalem at this time. But they have no expectation that God is going to work in their midst or that God is going to change a life. And he's, he's waking them up to the fact that they've fallen asleep to expecting God to be this in their midst. And so, he said to the men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though we by our own power or godly, or, uh, that as, as though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. Peter recognizes that they look at this man leaping and jumping and all, and now he's latched onto these two guys, and they're thinking somehow Peter and John healed this man. And Peter, in a period of real danger in public ministry when the Lord uses us, 
And He'll use us and He does use us. Is that when God does use us, that tendency to then begin to take the glory for it. And you do it subtle ways. And Peter throws the whole thing off by saying, listen, this man is not healed because of my power. And he's not healed because of my righteousness. There's that funny kind of subtle way when God uses us, the flesh will come in and say, well, you know, (laughs) these are pretty powerful hands. (laughs) I remember as a kid, I don't know if it's true or not, but, but I remember hearing about the fact that there were men in the world that knew karate and all, and their hands were lethal weapons, so lethal that they had to be registered with the government <laughs> as lethal weapons. Wow. You know, when you're an 11-year-old boy, wow, to have hands like that. <laughs> But he comes along, you know, and, and you, can get, you can give off that vibe where, you know, listen, if, if you had power in your life like I have power in my life and these hands and all that kind of stuff, and I begin to make people believe that somehow this has happened because I'm different from everybody else. And Peter said, no, this didn't happen because I'm more powerful than other people. And it didn't happen because I'm more righteous than other people, as he says here. It, it didn't happen because of my godliness. And that's another subtle kind of thing, isn't it? You see it all the time. Well, you know, God uses me because I, I pray a certain amount of time during the day and there's nothing wrong with being righteous. But God doesn't use me because of my own self-righteousness. I pray a certain amount of time and if you prayed as long as I did, then God would use you in the same way. If you read the Bible as much as I did, You did this as much as I did. And the whole vibe is, it's my righteousness. You know the problem with that? Either of those things is my power or my righteousness. It robs God of His glory. Because the fact of the matter is, when God uses any of us, He used a dirty, filthy, stinking rag that He sanctified by His own Son and the blood of His own Son. And that if He hadn't done all of it through our lives, there wouldn't have been a miracle at all at that, that temple area. And so he gets all the glory. And Peter is smart enough, or Peter would disappear from the book of Acts a little earlier than he does. Right here in chapter 3, he says, listen, it wasn't my power, it wasn't my godliness or my righteousness. God did all of this. Verse 13, here is the God did all of this. The God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Jacob. The God, oh no, is that there, is it? No. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers glorified His servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, referring to Jesus as the one who is holy and the one who is just, that is, without sin. And you not only denied Him, but then you asked for a murder. You asked for Barabbas to be released to you instead of Him and killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Peter is as blunt here in this sermon, as he was on the day of Pentecost. And what he does is he convicts them of sin. He reveals the fact that they have sinned, and thus they're in need of a Savior. And he said, and in His name, that is Jesus' name, through faith in His name, has made this man strong whom you see And no, yes, the faith which comes through Him has given this man perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You're amazed? You want to know what this healing means? What this healing means is the one that you killed didn't remain dead, but He was buried and He rose again on the third day and He sits at the right hand of the Father. That's why this miracle occurred, a changed life as a testimony to the fact that Jesus is alive. He's resurrected. And it's one of the greatest testimonies to His resurrection yet today. 
It's a changed life. Just in this room. There are rooms like this all over the city and all over the state, all over the country, all over the world. God continues to change lives. Every single one of us, what? A testimony that He's risen. That He's risen. Our life is a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the only explanation. I know it is for you, and I know it is for me. And then, having really kind of, you know, laid the screws down on him, like we saw last week, where he's kind of said, you killed your Messiah, and you ought to fry over it. And just when, the, you know, all the oxygen leaves the room, and they wonder if there's any hope for them. No, no gospel presentation is complete without infusing hope. And, and so here he comes in, and he says, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as also did your rulers. They, they knew that they were crucifying Jesus. But they really didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And they didn't believe him to be the Son of God. So there was an element of ignorance in it. And what is Peter doing? He's merely recognizing what Jesus said on the cross when Jesus prayed to the Father and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They knew a little bit about what they were doing, but not fully what they were doing and who they were doing it to. And yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance as also as did also your rulers. And so now, all right, hope, okay. What, all right, we're not quite as, you know, we deserve the fry, but I mean, maybe we won't. What, what comes next? But the, those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of His prophets that the Christ would suffer, He has fulfilled. And Peter again does what Paul is going to do all the way through the book of Acts 2 when he takes and speaks of Jesus as the Messiah. He always brings in the prophetic Scriptures. But Peter is saying, I'm not asking you to believe in Jesus as the Messiah just because I believe He's the Messiah, but because He fulfills the Old Testament Scriptures and the description of the Old Testament Scriptures concerning the Messiah who was to come. And the Old Testament Scriptures declared that when Messiah came, He would suffer. Isaiah chapter 52, 53, Psalm 22, and on and on it goes through the Old Testament Scriptures. And then He says, repent. Here's the application for them. He calls on them to repent, have a change of mind that produces a change of direction. Turn around from the direction that you're going in and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. And the word blotted is an interesting one. In those days, they, they didn't have the kind of acids that we do to put in the ink that allows the ink to penetrate the page. And so it was easy when something would be written off, to, written on a, on a page to then blot it out because it wouldn't penetrate as if it had never been written at all. And that's what he's saying here. And the word that he uses is that God will take your sin and He'll wash it away like it never existed at all. And so that your sins may be blotted out and so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that He may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. This is speaking of His second coming. So there's an, this anticipation even in Peter at the very beginning that there is this particular number of people that is going to be saved. And then when that fullness of the Gentiles occurs, that fullness of who is going to be saved occurs, then comes the rapture of the church and all of that great tribulation culminating in the second coming of Jesus who will bring refreshing to this world. And so He calls on them to repent and to believe in the Lord that their sins would be blotted out. And you know, this is one of the fascinating things about this very, very blunt sermon. I don't know who would put up with it anymore today. <laughs> We'd have to have, you know, therapists outside the back door for people to recover from that kind of bluntness even in church anymore. Bring in counselors from all over, grief counselors from everywhere in order to help people get through it. <laughs> You know the amazing thing is he says it to a religious crowd. He says it to a religious crowd. They practiced religion every single day of their life, and yet they needed to be saved. They need to be saved. And one of the things that we have to learn from the book of Acts as Christians 
is that just because a person is a religious person, it doesn't mean you keep the gospel to yourself. What portion of this world is engaged in religion? It has to be 80 to 90 percent of the people in this world identify themselves with some religious something. This is a very religious world. And if somebody comes along and says, well, I'm a this or I'm a that, and we go, oh, 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 oh. there's no need, no, no, no need to say anything to you on that, then we're not going to evangelize the overwhelming majority of the world if we don't recognize that a person can be religious and completely on the way to hell. Because religion has all of the religions of the world. They're distinct from Christianity because they have a common denominator. And the common denominator is that if I do these certain things, I can make myself acceptable to God. In other words, all religious systems have the idea that man has in his own ability, votes through some effort granted, an ability to reach up to God. And Christianity comes along and says self-righteousness is not acceptable at all. It's not acceptable in heaven. And Christianity is God reaching down to save man. That's the difference between the two. One is based upon a self-righteousness which is unacceptable. And then the other is based upon a righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Jesus being put to our account because we put our faith and trust in the simple gospel message. The salvation is found in Jesus, the Savior, heaven's Savior. And so here he takes and he preaches that gospel to them. And nobody knew how religious these Jews were like another religious Jew or formerly religious Jew. And that's Peter. We speak of the Jews here, but you could speak of the Hindus. You could speak of the Muslims. You could speak of the Mormons. You could speak of the Jehovah Witnesses. You could speak of Shintoism. You could speak of Buddhism. You could speak of Roman Catholicism. I don't believe that all Roman Catholics are unsaved. But I didn't have to pay my dues in the Roman Catholic Church to be able to say it, but I did pay my dues in the Roman Catholic Church. And it's possible to be firmly entrenched in that church and never hear the gospel and the necessity of being born again by the Holy Spirit. So it's just somebody says, well, I'm a Catholic. What if, somebody, what if everybody in my life would say, well, I'm a Catholic? When I was a Catholic, I said, oh, well, okay, that's fine, you're fine. Somebody's, somebody's got to tell me the gospel. And I may already be saved as a Catholic, but I may not be saved in that religious system. But it doesn't matter what the religious system is, somebody's got to come and tell me the gospel. And we have this long history of being able to be saved in this room tonight because men and women filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with love like Peter is here spoke the gospel to religious people and God did His part in the whole thing and He opened up their hearts to the truth of it and they were born again by the Holy Spirit. And so the importance of recognizing that much of the harvest field in this world is going to mean declaring the gospel to people who already believe in something about God. So tonight, you may sit here tonight and you've been steeped in religion all of your life. You, I mean, you fill in the blanks. I throw out half a dozen of things that people can recognize in this room and all, but you can, you can fill in the blanks in your own mind. And the question is, are you born again? Are you born again? Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night there in John chapter 3. He's a Pharisee. He's a ruler of the Pharisees. Jesus, doesn't go, Jesus looks at him and, and Nicodemus comes in with a little flattery, a little this, a little that, and all that. And Jesus looks at him and says, Unless a man be born again, he shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> And then he begins to speak about what it means to be born again. It's a spiritual birth. That when I confess my sin to God, acknowledging that I am a sinner in need of a Savior, and then in confessing my sin, then say to God, but I believe that You loved me so much that You sent Your Son to die on that cross for my sins. 
And I believe that His death upon that cross is the full and the satisfying payment for the forgiveness of my sins. And I believe He was buried and He rose again on the third day. And I do turn from my own ways, God, because I'm sick of them and I know they're wrong. And I turn Your way and I give You my life. And when a person does that, God's Holy Spirit comes into their life. And that's what being born again is, is to be born again by the Holy Spirit. And now I have God inside of me. That's what Christianity is now. And now I have the ability to have a personal relationship with God by the Holy Spirit. That's all that happens. That's what it's all about. All in that it's simple, but it's the most profound thing that happens on the face of the earth every single day. So I just want you to know that in some amount of time, I'll go home, Lord willing, and I'll fall asleep tonight. And I will sleep the way that a person who is thoroughly saved can sleep. The roof could fly off, and I wouldn't know it. And I don't want a single one of you to leave this place tonight and to look and say, well, I'm glad that he's all confident in everything, but I have no assurance that if I were to die tonight, I'd go to heaven. And you can leave with that assurance tonight. Religion works crawling on your hands and knees for miles or whatever kind of things religion may require, it is that there's no way into heaven that way. And Peter comes in and he makes it clear to them. Then he says in verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. And him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these things. Days And so again, he lays down a biblical basis for believing in Jesus as the Messiah. You couldn't just come to the Jews and say, listen, um, you know, Jesus works for me and I think he'll work for you. (laughs) No Jew was going to believe in anyone as a Messiah on the basis of that. You have to show them from the Scriptures. And Moses had spoken from the very beginning. God had said, Moses, tell my people that a prophet like you is going to come and that when he comes, speaking of the Messiah, they should listen to him. Moses was very highly esteemed and to this day is by the Jews. And so Peter is kind of calling in witnesses here where he's saying, listen, I'm not asking you to believe in Jesus on the basis of just what I'm saying. Moses himself, the great Moses, the great lawgiver, declared that a Messiah would come who would demand that you listen to him in the same way that you listen to me, Moses would say. And so Peter wasn't asking anything extraordinary or unbiblical in all of this. It all had its foundation in the Scriptures. And in verse 25, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For to you first, God having raised up His servant Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's a great blessing from God, isn't it? I know everybody's got a Rolls Royce and everybody's driving a Jaguar and all that because we're the king's kids. All these goofy things that we think are really important to God. What's the great gift? He tells us right here in verse 25 that He has blessed us in turning away every one of us from our iniquities, from our old way of life. That's a pretty valuable gift, isn't it? Isn't it great? You may not have two quarters to rub together tonight, and yet you know God has changed your life and He's turned you from your iniquities. You are richer than 99.999% of the people in this world because of what God has done for you and the quality of life that you live and that I live because of that gospel and because of the changes that God has made in our lives. The power to change a 
life. We'll stop there tonight, but we must make one other point so that we don't leave anybody hanging on this. We find out in the next chapter, in verse 4, that at the end of the preaching of that sermon, 5,000 people got saved. (laughs) Nobody was afraid of the truth. Nobody was afraid of the power of the truth that Peter preached. Because God will always do His end in bringing conviction into human hearts and saying yea and amen to the gospel in, in their life. Our responsibility is, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, to be faithful to that great commission, proclaim that gospel, and God will take care of His end. And the hardest pr- group of people to save in all of the world are religious people because they don't see a need. They're already self-satisfied. They're already in, they already think they're on their way. They already think they're fine. Here is Peter just speaks as simple a gospel as you could ever preach to a group of people. So simple and so clear. And yet God got through to 5,000 of the hardest hearts in all of the world. And He does it yet today. So we'll stop there tonight. And we'll pick things up in chapter 4 next week. So the worship team will come forward quite a bit to look at tonight and to just consider